This is a combined re-upload of my most recent video, and an older video with low views. The idea is to take stories from multiple episodes that most subscribers didn't watch, and put them together into a longer video in hopes of reaching more viewers. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by my new show, Freaky Folklore. Join host Carmen Carrion as she reveals the meaning and lore behind your favorite monsters through short stories and historical data. Upcoming episodes will be about black-eyed children and skinwalkers, so don't miss it. Check out Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes or go to eeriecast.com. Links are also in the description. Now as for today's show, we've got an assortment of wonderfully eerie tales featuring a scary diving encounter, strangers in the garden, and the terrifying things that go on at water treatment plants after dark. Enjoy these stories and send me your own at darkstories.org. I'm looking for Grand Canyon stories at the moment. Now, let's begin. A Strange Happening from Black Cat 1206 One day, my cousins and I were playing in the back garden. It was a warm, sunny day in mid-July. The air was kind of hazy and full of the sounds of summer. Insects hid in the long grass, just outside the boundaries of the safe garden. The garden and heath ran right through without a fence, gate, or any other type of barrier, dividing our private back garden from the public very busy heath. For example, if you were playing in the back garden, and a random person walked past on the way to the heath, they were clearly visible from anywhere within the vicinity of the garden, as well as being very audible. Even down to the point, if the person knew our family, they were able to conduct a simple conversation with whatever kids were playing there. Gran always told us kids that the area directly outside the limit of the garden was strictly forbidden. And because she knew us three girls better than the back of her hand, this statement came with an extremely stern warning that if this rule wasn't followed, we would all receive smacked bottoms. We all abided even though the three of us had adventurous spirits. At the time of the incident, we were all playing on the crazy pathing path that our builder's uncles had made to make it easier for my wheelchair to run safely along the ground as I played with the other kids. Elle was pushing me as fast as she could go, and I, in turn, was pushing the ancient family pram that had been there longer than any of us had. We were playing mummies. As usual, being the oldest, our cousin G was mum, and picking flowers for the milk bottle in our tree bush house. It was more a cluster of bushes at the bottom of the garden, with a clearing which was easier to adapt into a wheelchair-accessible treehouse, where all us kids played at one time or another. Suddenly, there was a sense of not being alone. I think Ellen and I both noticed this at the same time, because we raised our heads and looked in the exact same direction, where the creeping feeling resonated. Just outside the back garden's entrance stood a strange-looking figure. We all said after the incident that the figure appeared to be a middle-aged, stocky man, dressed in shabby dark clothes. He called out to us, Hello. How are you? We didn't answer like we usually did to passers-by who we knew. The stranger continued. I've lost my dog. Have you seen a little white dog? Being overprotective, G answered curtly. No, no, we haven't seen any dogs at all. The stranger didn't look at G. Instead, he kept his attention on L and I, although he did respond to G's remark. Oh, dear. Will you help me look for her? She's not very old, and she might be lost. She couldn't have gotten too far. I automatically began to feel uneasy, and I knew Elle felt the same too as I felt her pull my wheelchair back. I let go of the pram, 
even though we were a good distance away from the stranger. The stranger was motionless throughout this discourse. Indeed, it was eerie how still he was. G just turned eleven and was adamant. I'm sorry about your dog, but we can't help you. We're not allowed to leave the garden. The stranger remained still and measured. Come on, you won't be away for long. I'll pay you five pounds if you help. Just then, our older male cousin came around the side of the house, pushing his bike, followed by a family friend who also lived at the house. They had both returned home from work. Our attention was momentarily distracted away from the figure by their sudden arrival, and when we looked back in the direction the stranger had been, he had completely vanished. What's up with you? We all excitedly told H and our family friend about the strange happening and the man. While the family friend, slightly unnerved by our account, rounded the three of us up and hurried us inside, H immediately marched out of the back garden in the direction of where we said the man must have gone, cursing under his breath about dirty old men perving on little girls, only to return twenty minutes later, hot, bothered, and cross. Were you three having a laugh or what? He said angrily. There wasn't a man on the way I went. In fact, I never saw anyone at all. It's too hot to play stupid games, you little brats. The three of us were obviously indignant at this slur, as we had all seen and spoken to the same man. Later, when we were in the bedroom with my mom, she asked us about the incident. I still often talk about that day with my mom and cousins. We still have no idea where the strange man could have gone, or who he was. Wendigo from Lucky 12. This was a few years ago. My family and I had gone up to my grandparents' house. They had 10 acres of land and only used about one to one and a half acres for the house and yard. They had a large, dense pine forest area all around their house. Except for the road leading there, there was forest for miles around. They had cut down some trees to make four-wheeler paths that we could ride on when we went up there. One day, my sister and I were riding out on the paths on some of my grandparents' four-wheelers. For whatever reason, I think it was to get a drink, but I don't entirely remember, my sister went inside. I thought nothing of it and kept riding the four-wheeler I was on. About three minutes later, I was driving past a really dense patch of the forest, over the four-wheeler engine, I heard a loud growl. I heard it clearly to my left in the patch of forest. Thinking it was just a coyote, I looked over towards where I heard the growl, but I did not see a coyote. You know that feeling when you look into the woods at night, and you get scared that something is staring back at you? Well, this happened to me in the middle of the day. But I did soon see something. What I saw still haunts me to this day. I was staring into two large yellow eyes. They appeared to be sunken into the creature's face. The eyes were probably about 1.75 times the size of a normal human eye, and they were watching me. I could see by looking at the eyes alone that this was a smart creature. I didn't get to see what it was because it was standing in a bush. This bush was very large, probably about 10 feet tall, and yet about 8 feet up in this bush is where I saw these eyes. I couldn't see any other part of the creature, but I did not stick around to find out what it was. I put the four-wheeler into drive and sped up to about 55 or 60 miles per hour. I ran inside and I did not go back out on the paths for the rest of the trip. No one else in my family saw anything, but I was terrified of whatever I'd seen. 
Fast forward six years to this year. I was talking with my friend about scary things we'd seen. I told him about this story and began to wonder what I could have possibly seen. I did a lot of research on what large predatory animals live up there. If you don't believe me and want to go check yourself, it was in northern Idaho. I didn't believe it was anything beyond normal. I was skeptical of anything paranormal. But besides bears, I couldn't find anything that could be in Idaho that was eight feet tall. I just didn't want to believe it was something that no one had ever captured or have been able to prove existed. The largest wolf ever found would have only been six feet tall standing on its hind legs. Sure, a large bear might have been large enough, but it could not have fit within that bush. So I continued my research on what possible creature it could have been. Eventually, I did find tales of the Wendigo. If it was a Wendigo, I don't know why it didn't attack me, or why it let me get away. Based off the features I saw, the large yellow sunken in eyes, I can only see it being a Wendigo. What scared me even more is that a couple years later, my grandparents moved from that house for an unknown reason. They say it was to be closer to family, but the family was always fine making a long drive and coming up quite often. And they only moved a bit closer. It's still a very long drive. So, what were they running from? Something that peaks from James 3727. About four years ago, when I was 28, I used to volunteer for babysitting with my girlfriend at the time. We watched two kids in a rural area in southern New Jersey. Awesome kids. One six and one seven. One night, my girlfriend kept saying that the boy is walking around his room on the nanny cam. To be honest, I just figured it's no big deal. Some kids do sleepwalk. So I ended up staying with the kids this night. My girlfriend had gone out to run home, which was about 30 minutes away. During this time, Benjamin came downstairs and asked me to come up to his room. I agreed since he was acting weird, walking around apparently asleep. At that moment, he was clearly awake though. I followed him upstairs and fixed a nightlight for him. No big deal. My girlfriend texted me about 20 minutes later and said to look at the nanny cam. This time he wasn't walking around but staring at his closet, which in this style of house was a loft with the pointed ceiling and had his closet door removed to make it a play area with it kind of being an extension of the room. So he's just staring at the open doorway when I see him make his way towards the door to leave the room, and he comes down and gets me. That was when I obliged and followed him up to his room, and he sat next to me on the bed. I asked him what was wrong. He then said the creepiest thing I've ever heard. He points toward the closet door and says, There's something that peeks in there. I asked what he meant, and he said, There's something that talks like a person, but it doesn't look like a person. It's dusty and black, and it looks at me while I lay in bed. I assured him it was okay. Then I asked, What does it say to him? He replied, It looks through the door and whispers, Hey or just watches me. I literally have never been more terrified in my life. He sounded so genuine, so serious. How do you make something like that up? I tried to be strong for him, and luckily kids don't notice goosebumps covering your body. I no longer babysit there, and the owner has since moved. Horrible Night Shift Sounds from Edgar Allen. I'm a water treatment plant operator in West Texas. I've worked the night shift for about eight years. 
The building I spend most of the night shift in was built in 1955. It has had several upgrades over the years, but many of the same components are original. In the basement, there are pipes, pumps, wiring conduits, and other such things. The building is built like a fortress, solid concrete floors and a flat concrete roof. The walls are cinder blocks, in other words, a very sturdy building. I do lab work, tests on the water such as chlorine content, pH and temp, alkalinity, at scheduled intervals, usually every four hours. I work from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I have, over the years, heard strange sounds. Creaks, moans, bangs, pops, thuds, etc. I think it's just due to temperature changes during the day to night transition, so I usually don't pay too much attention to them. But one night was different. I was going over some paperwork about 2 a.m. one night a few years ago. Everything was dead quiet. I'd like to mention that the street in front of the plant is not a well-traveled street, but there is moderate traffic at times. Also, there is a dip at the intersection in front of the plant. I've seen several unaware motorists go over the dip way too fast, and I've literally seen sparks come out from the bottom of their cars when they bottom out on the other side of the dip. Seems like people forget that the speed limit on the street is 30 miles per hour. They get reminded in an abrupt way when this happens. Anyway, on that particular night, I heard one of the loudest noises I've ever heard while working nights. It sounded exactly like a vehicle crashing into the building. I heard glass breaking, tires screeching, metal breaking. I jumped up, grabbed my cell phone, and was headed towards the front doors ready to dial 911. I opened the doors expecting to see a horrible scene. To my amazement, there was nothing. I mean nothing. No crashed car, no people, no sounds. I was astounded. I ran around the side of the building thinking that the car had just glanced off the building and kept going. But there were no marks on the road or any indication that anything out of the ordinary had happened. I just stood there for a few minutes, thinking I must have been losing my mind. I don't know how I would have mistaken that sound for a car crashing into the building. I didn't know what else to do but put the matter behind me and continue to work. I haven't heard the noise again, and I hope I don't. An interesting thing I noticed a few days later is that there is a fairly large piece of concrete missing from the foundation of the building on the outside corner where I heard the noise. The only thing is, it's been painted over years ago. The damage isn't in any way fresh or new. But could I have heard a residual noise stuck in time from an accident that happened years ago? What would have made me the only one that heard it? There are houses across the street. Seems like someone else would have heard it too, but no one ever came out. It was very strange indeed. Abandoned mansion? I don't think so. From Grizzlord. Littleton, Colorado. This encounter occurred in June of 2020. I was 12 years old, living in a neighborhood next to a place called Jackass Hill. A weird name to be sure. Jackass Hill is a little field. A popular place to watch the sunset. Across the busy street from the field is an unfinished, abandoned mansion that was bigger than any of the other houses. It had been built over the course of nine years, but the workers apparently just gave up. For several years now, I've wanted to explore that house more than anything. And finally, I did. Well, not really. I snuck out of the house with a flashlight and my bike. I biked down the busy road, which wasn't so busy at almost midnight. I made sure no cars were coming, then parked my bike, took a deep breath, and opened the door. That was another weird thing. The door was unlocked. At this point, you might be thinking I'm a stupid kid who's just looking for trouble. But you'd be wrong. 
Now I'm not saying that I'm not stupid, it's just that I'm a mixture of brave, confident, and stupid. I didn't bother closing the door, in case I decided to bail in a hurry. I walked slowly through the house, tiptoeing, almost expecting my mom to come in the front door and drag me home, scolding me. But as I would soon regret, that never happened. Funny enough, every ten minutes or so I would hear a floorboard creak, and I would perk my ears up to see if any noise was coming from the front door in case it was my mom. Then, around 12.30, I began to hear voices, like whispers, coming from the walls and the floor and the ceiling. I was starting to get creeped out, but I figured that once I was done, my friends would think I was brave. Now that I look back on it, that wasn't at all realistic. Here's where the whole expedition goes from A-OK -okay to abandoned ship. At one point around 12.45, I heard a voice that sounded like my mom's. Come here, Truitt. I hurt my leg. Help me. But there was something wrong. If it was my mom, and she had hurt herself, why didn't I hear anything? Also, my mom's voice was twisted, almost a monotone. After the voice followed a cackle, like a sick hyena. I waited for a bit longer, maybe only 10 seconds, when out of nowhere came this ear-piercing scream. It sounded like a mixture of a desperate woman and a whinnying horse. I wanted to run, but my legs were glued to the ground. I was about to do something stupid, I can't really remember what, when I saw a dark figure step out of the shadows. Before zipping out of the house like my pants were on fire, I got a good look at the creature. It was tall, like Shaquille O'Neal tall. It was skinny yet somewhat leanly muscular, kind of like male models. Except this creature was hideous. It looked like the creature had been shredded apart and put back together by a preschooler with rage issues. Its face was that of a deer, except for the fact that there was no skin. Its eyes were like black holes devoid of life and joy. After stepping out of the shadows, it said one word and that same voice. Run. I didn't have to be told. I was out of there before it could tell me otherwise. I grabbed my bike, not caring to put on my helmet, and I pedaled home, the whole time repeatedly checking over my shoulder. I won't be going back there. I'm not safe in my own house. From Edward Cullen, Alpha Wolf. Well, I thought ghosts didn't exist. My friends and I would just laugh about it. Now I think differently. You see, there's always a feeling in my house that someone is there, and it's really creepy. Last night I was watching random stuff on TV, cause there wasn't much of anything else to do. At one point I figured I'd better do my nightly routine. I got up, got ready for bed, and was perfectly fine. Except for one thing. There was a noise in the next room over. Thinking it was my sister, I just went on with what I was doing. Then something fell off the shelf in the next room over. I was tired of my sister playing games with me, so I went into the room, about to tell her to stop messing around. But no one was in there. I was confused, but I put it back on the shelf and went back to minding my own business. I got in bed and watched TV for a few more minutes. I was hearing noises again, so I decided to look out the window. I stood there for a minute, having a feeling that someone was watching me. Then I heard a noise like someone was knocking on the wall. By then, I was pretty creeped out, so I just walked back to my room. The whole time, I felt like something was watching me. Then I heard what sounded like scuffing on the carpet. I thought it was just my cat, so I ignored it. Then the lights flickered. That was enough. I was sick of someone messing with me. So I grabbed the baseball bat I kept at my bed 
in case I had to defend myself if someone broke in. But then I heard breathing. Once again, I assumed it was my sister trying to scare me. I held the bat tightly. As I walked up to the room, I saw no one there. I heard the house creaking as if someone was sneaking around, and I was ready to kill whatever it was just so I could get some sleep. I turned on the light and once again saw nothing. I turned it out and walked away. Then there came this knocking sound at the door. I checked that too, but nothing was there. I was now extremely tired of all of it, so I just went back to bed. It was about 12 before I finally went to sleep. Carmel, my cat, came running in suddenly and jumped right on my bed. He tugged on the belt loop of my pants. I sighed and got up, and I heard another knock at the door. I wasn't about to go out the door and yell at the person because I wasn't wearing a shirt. I looked out the window and didn't see anyone yet again. Ugh, this was so tiresome. I went out the door and took my cat with me and slept in the shed out back instead because I was just too exhausted to care anymore. The next thing I was expecting was to hear it follow me out there too, but it didn't. I slept the rest of the night. The next morning, I went back in the house and I didn't hear anything anymore. It was confusing. I never heard it again, but I always felt something was there wanting to haunt me. I can guarantee that if you feel something is watching you, but no one is there, there is something in your house, and it would probably not be good to stay. It probably means there's something that is bad, or it's some feeling that it's telling you something is wrong, and you shouldn't stick around. A Peculiar Undersea Creature From Avid Diver Big Splash I'm a man that has always loved the underwater world. Its vibrant colors and almost alien-looking creatures have always interested me. This weird creature showed up during a pleasure dive with my friends and now fiancé. My friend Abigail, who was pregnant at the time, which we didn't know, texted me to tell me to bring my stuff to our designated meeting spot. When I arrived there, I could see my diving friends standing at the dock waiting for me as well as my now fiancé, who at the time was my ex-girlfriend. Mark walked up to me, saying, My man, it's been a while. To which we did our own secret handshake. We've been doing it since college. After greeting Melissa and Charlie, it was time to greet my ex-girlfriend, Jess. You look good, water drop. Was the first thing Jess said, which I replied to with, Hey, I know, I do both in and outside the water. We then heard a speedboat coming and saw Abigail and her husband Carl were coming up to the docks. Carl shouted at us, Get your carcasses in here, you pieces of driftwood! To which we all boarded the boat and got into our wetsuits. After we all showed up on deck, everyone except Abigail was in a wetsuit. Hey Abby, aren't you going to get in? Charlie asked, but the reply of Abigail surprised us all. Well, I'm pregnant, so it's not going to be a good idea to go diving now, isn't it? We were all so excited for her and Carl, congratulating them. Abigail then said, Well, we wanted to do a dive together before we get to be parents, and may have to cut back on all the fun stuff after. She sighed and continued, That's why we bought all this expensive stuff, so we could all communicate underwater. Everything was all ready for our dive, so we all went in, except Abigail. Jess hung around me just like before we broke up. We'd broke up a few times before, but always ended up back together, so there was never any heat between us. As we went swimming close to the surface, we saw all kinds of beautiful and colorful fishes and coral. After about an hour, though, we went further into the ocean, and began diving deeper. It was then that I heard Jess say over the comms, Oh my god, look at this. I turned around to which she shoved her rear end near my face and said, Look, a moonfish. 
This has been a joke within our friend group pretty much since the start, and it's how Jess and I first got together. The dive went on and we encountered some sharks, of which I'm a huge fan of. Jess and I just drifted around looking at the sharks and other ocean life around them. After a few minutes, I noticed a dark figure well below the sharks, and I won't lie, I was curious about what it was. Man, did I wish I wasn't. The sharks then dispersed and swam into every direction, catching both me and Jess by surprise. The worst was yet to come, sadly, as the dark creature that I saw came bursting up and bit Jess right on the left leg. I heard her scream over the comms. I saw the water around the creature's mouth turning slowly red. I had a shock stick with me, but no matter how much I shocked the creature, it wouldn't budge, and it was now starting to drag Jess down. It was then that I hit the creature in what I believe was the eye, and it let go of her. The water around her was now clouded in red, and I could hear her say, It hurts, please help me, it hurts. But before I could even reach her, the creature bit her yet again. This time it had both her legs trapped in its massive mouth and was now even at her waist with its mouth. Jess kept screaming. I heard Abigail through the comms, but I was too distracted, too terrified to know what she said. I then looked at the creature. Its head was shaped like a barracuda's, with a body that looked like a balloon followed by a tail that closely resembled a dolphin's tail. I'd never seen anything like it. The screams of Jess just kept coming as the creature began thrashing about. I continued hitting it with the stick. Melissa and Charlie started to show up in the distance. The monster then suddenly let go of Jess, who was clearly in tons of pain as she screamed like nothing else. I told Abigail to call for immediate help, to which she replied, Just did. Bring her topside right now. I swam up with Jess while Melissa and Charlie swam below us keeping an eye out for any wildlife that could be a threat to us going up. As Jess and I rushed to the surface, a trauma helicopter came flying over the boat, and after a while, Jess was flown off to safety. I was still in the water at that point and decided to take a look below me. I saw that Melissa and Charlie were just drifting underwater. I then saw a familiar figure below them and told them to immediately swim up and get out of the water. Luckily, they listened, and we got out of the water together, but not before the creature nearly bit Charlie's foot, showing its head above water, to which Abigail shouted with amazement in her voice, That is the biggest barracuda I've ever seen. I had taken off my mask by then, and told them, That's the creature that injured Jess. They all looked at me with shock, but we're all people that go by seeing is believing. When we finally made it to the hospital, Jess had already been operated on and was now asleep and well in a room. Our friends agreed I should be the one to stay with her that night, so I did. When I woke up the next day, Jess was already awake and smiling at me. Thanks for not leaving me with that thing. I smiled back. Anyway, Abigail would go on to have a healthy daughter and Jess and I are now expecting our first child together as well. The scars of the creature's attacks are still on full display on Jess's body, but she's not ashamed of them. When our child is born, we'll go diving some more. I just hope we don't run into that creature again, because next time, I don't think we'll come back with all the people we go diving in with. The Paintings from Mystic Mutic I used to work for a real estate company where I'd survey locations to see whether or not they were worth flipping. Basically, I spent my days in abandoned buildings, more than anyone should. It was a good thing my teenage years were occupied by some light urban exploration. While most times I went to these locations with one of my coworkers, a burly man named Sam, but there were a handful of times when I'd be sent out on my own. This instance ended up being one such solo trip. 
It had snowed the previous night, and while it was shoveled or melted off the main walkways, there was still enough of it to be troublesome. Sam and I were supposed to meet at the house, but he had texted me during the drive, saying something about how his kid was sick, and he couldn't make it. If anything goes wrong, call me, he'd ended the message with. I sighed. Sure, it was understandable, but I hated going into such broken-down places on my own. It just seemed too dangerous for my taste. At least, for my adult taste. Even with the ease that I opened the door, it was apparently enough force to nearly tear it from its hinges. With a glance at the rusted hinges, I made a few notes in my book before stepping inside. I closed the door behind me in an effort to keep out as much of the cold as I could. The interior was in better shape than I imagined, with furniture tossed about rather than the structural damage I was anticipating. The first floor checked out and was better than I imagined. A few strokes of the pin and I moved on to check upstairs. With a huff, I picked up one of the fallen shelves that had blocked the stairs. Crap, I thought aloud, looking at the holes that all but littered the steps. With cautious footsteps, as though walking on a tightrope, I eased up the stairs, hoping to make it to the second floor in one piece. This floor was where the bedrooms and bathroom were located, but it didn't look anything like the first. Where the first had been just a bit out of sorts, the second looked to have suffered through a storm. The walls were torn and hole-ridden. Torn mattresses were thrown against walls or onto the floor, and the floorboards looked dangerous. Though I tried to keep my footsteps on the solid-looking floorboards, one gave way and a sharp pain jolted through my foot, which was burrowed into the wood. My boots ensured the wood hadn't scraped against my foot, but the pain wasn't leaving any time soon. Even before I pulled it out, I knew my pants were not so lucky. The fabric by the ankle had been turned to Swiss cheese, and I cursed. One hand reached toward the nearby doorframe as the other searched for anything else to gain some leverage and pull my foot out. I found a string that seemed to lead up to an attic space and decided that that would work well enough. With both hands gripping these objects, I pulled down and thrusted my leg upward. There was a sudden rush of pain, but I was able to free myself. But it was with this motion that the ladder-like staircase was pulled down, and I went crashing to the floor. It was nothing short of a miracle that I didn't fall through those floorboards and land somewhere in the living room below. I jumped to my feet and dusted myself off, all the while cursing up a storm. Finally, I looked up. To my surprise... These pull-down stairs were the most well-kept thing in the house, and they looked brand new. Curiosity overwhelmed me. I sent a quick message to James, telling him the place was a dump, but I was checking the attic now. Maybe because I wanted to make sure that if anything happened, Sam would realize and get me out of there. Shaking off the pain in my foot, I tested the first few steps and the rails that bordered them. Convinced they were safe enough, I made a slow ascent. The only sliver of light came from the breaks in the wood planks that covered the window. It wasn't enough to properly maneuver, so I pulled out my flashlight, and I nearly leapt back down the steps when I turned it on. The space was cluttered with images of people, all different subjects in different mediums. There were paintings over there, pictures along the wall, Polaroids hanging from the ceiling. All of very different people with one thing in common. None of them looked normal. There was a distorted aspect about each of them. Gangly limbs, jagged teeth and mouths much too wide, eyes too far apart, too animalistic. Skin shades of green or yellow that only came with sickness Bodies set at impossible bone-shattering angles, an array of indents into the skin, as though hands had squeezed the flesh. Something was wrong about each picture, and the longer I stared, the harder my stomach lurched upward. 
I'd seen some weird things in my time, but nothing so gut-wrenching as those images. I clambered back down the steps with no regard for safety or caution, causing the true instability of such new-looking steps to make itself known. My already injured foot broke through one of the rails, and I lost my balance before I was even halfway down. While I remember tumbling downward, I don't remember hitting those sketchy floorboards, but nobody really remembers passing out. They just remember waking up in a strange position at a time of day they don't remember venturing out into or another space entirely. Next thing I remember is waking up to the sound of Sam calling out to me from the entrance. Turns out I'd fallen through those darned floorboards and had broken a few bones in the process. I also sustained a concussion which may have been what knocked me out in the first place. Good thing it had too, as all that pain would have been a fresh kind of hell. All because of a room filled with creepy paintings. Speaking of those paintings, there wasn't any trace of the attic I claimed to have climbed up into. By the time Sam had arrived with the police, the stairs were nowhere to be found, and unlike myself, he wasn't about to go exploring. The ratty old building was condemned and eventually knocked down, replaced with a hotel. The same one that I found myself staying just a few days ago. It's the reason I'm writing these incidents out to begin with. It was late when I checked into the hotel, but all I could think about was getting to a bed as fast as possible. If I was focused enough to really look at the lobby, then I'd have gotten the heck out of there. Instead, I just dragged myself to the room, and all but collapsed down onto the too stiff mattress. I was drifting off when a loud bang had me bolting upright. I sat there trying to steady my breathing and looked around the room, trying to listen to anything else. For a while, there was nothing. Then there was this rhythmic knocking. Slow knocks, as though someone was asking permission to be let in. It would be slightly understandable if the sound had come from the door instead of the wall behind me, like the person in the other room was knocking against the wall, knowing that's where the bed was on the other side. My heart leapt into my throat and sweat coated my skin. A curse slipped from my lips as I reached back to pound on the wall. In the deepest voice I could muster, I yelled for whoever it was in the other room to stop. The sound came to a halt and the silence returned. After a few minutes of nothing, I collapsed back down and tried to get back to sleep. No such luck. The knocking started up as soon as my head hit the pillow and continued on throughout the night. I thought about going over there and causing a scene, but I decided to let it go. It was just one night, not worth the energy. Somehow I drifted off and was awakened by the bright morning sun hitting my eyes, as my exhausted state kept me from closing the blinds. I set up, and following a groan-filled stretch, I got my things together to check out, more eager than ever to get home and into my own bed. When I got into the hall, though, I stopped, and I found myself looking over to the room beside me. I wanted to see just who was bothering me all night, or to wake them up in the middle of their sleep. I made my way over. It wasn't a room at all, or at least not for the guests. It was the office for the hotel's manager with its door propped open, and one of the managers, an older gentleman with a graying beard, sat at the desk. Startled, I knocked on the door as I eased it open, greeting the man with a confused smile. Um, I didn't know this was an office. I heard a knocking against the wall all night long and I thought there was a kid staying over here, I explained. Just wanted to let you know in case there was something wrong. The man apologized profusely for my experience and offered me a cup of coffee from his private espresso machine something I couldn't say no to. When I stepped inside, though, eager for the coffee that would put the sludge they usually offered to shame, I froze. My stomach lurched upward, and a pain, more memory than anything real, shot through my leg. Hanging on the wall across from the manager's desk 
was none other than one of those distorted paintings. This one of a woman, tall and gangly, standing beneath a tree that was entirely too small to be giving off any sort of shade for her. She was smiling, head tilted at an uncomfortable angle, but not toward the painter, instead down at a child, a totally normal looking child. It made her appearance look all the more grotesque. The promise of coffee had left my mind and without another word, I apologized and ran out of the room. I nearly knocked over a few carts on my way out to the car, fumbling with my keys all the while. They fell to the floor in the lobby, and when I reached down to grab them, I noticed the painting hanging on the wall behind the reception desk. I recognized it instantly. It was the first painting I'd laid eyes on in that forsaken attic. That of a family dressed in Victorian clothing, sitting on a plush couch with a bouquet of flowers in the mother's hand. They all looked mostly normal, save for the mouths that were too wide and the eyes far too black and soulless to be that of a human. I'm surprised that I didn't get pulled over for how far over the speed limit I'd gone to cut my once two-hour car ride down to a little over an hour. The whole ride home, all I could think about were those pictures and what sort of demented mind it took to create them. What sort of person would want to save them and hang them up in their office? as decor for a hotel. I couldn't wrap my head around it, not even as I got home and my wife surprised me with a present. I'm sure you know deep down where this is going. I had to write it down. Get it out there. I can't explain my experience or why these pictures just keep popping up in my life, but I just want it out. I wish I'd never found them in the first place. I wish I'd never climbed that ladder never investigated the second floor, never went into that house on my own, because I know now it's a choice that will follow me forever, a choice I will never get away from. I just hope you don't make the same mistake. White Thing in the Mountains from J. Pratt, 0531 so to set this story, which I remember as though it was yesterday, myself and my close group of friends would always race the mountains near our hometown. This particular mountain range being called the Back of the Dragon. We were out one night in my buddy's old beat up Jeep Cherokee, trying to see who could make it to the top the fastest. We'd all felt kind of weird that night, as though something was off. We had just turned a hairpin corner about a half mile from the top of the mountain and were starting the next bend when he slammed on the brakes. As the car came skidding to a stop, we all saw this massive white creature pick itself up beside the guardrail. Just for perspective, in that spot the guardrail is almost four feet high. It barely reached the creature's hips. It turned and looked at us with these horribly yellow eyes, teeth bared on its dog-like face. It stood for a moment before jumping off the side of the mountain. Not walk, not fly, it jumped down a 300-foot bank and disappeared into the night. We continued to drive to the top and sat for a while, just trying to take in what had occurred. Not long after, we heard a bellowing roar coming from the trees behind the jeep. Luckily for us, that abused little jeep managed not to stall as we made quite possibly the fastest time we've ever made back down the horrific mountain. We still get nervous on that curve to this day. None of us have been man enough to stop on that curve at night, and very rarely do we take the mountain roads anymore. The last time we did, we saw those same awful yellow eyes glaring from the trees. Watch yourself in the mountains of southwest Virginia. You're definitely not alone. The following stories are a compilation of experiences submitted by the same viewer. Mine and my brother's dark encounters from Marshall. 
Even now, I'm still not sure what the heck me and my brothers encountered. I never thought I would encounter anything paranormal, but it appears that I have. This story involves some encounters my two younger brothers and I have had with seemingly paranormal events. My brothers and I have been interested in the paranormal from TV shows we watched, like Ghost Adventures. I, on the other hand, was 50-50 with anything paranormal. I believed in it, but not as much as my brothers. I always thought I could rely on facts and deductive reasoning, but after my own experiences and listening to my brothers tell their own, I now know that there are things in this world that not even facts and deductive reasoning could explain. 1. My first encounter took place when I was in middle school around the age of 15. It was after school and I was in the school's basement. I had a job of cleaning the bowling alley the school had every Thursday. One of these days, I had been at the bowling alley for about 10 minutes. I was beginning to wash down the top of the bar. I was starting to get thirsty though, so I got a plastic cup from the stack that sat on the bar. I filled it up with water from the sink. As I was close to emptying my drink, I heard a loud clink from the workshop area. This startled me, of course, but seeing that this bowling alley was around 80 years old, my deductive reasoning told me that the noise was one of the machines making some sound, as they tend to do so often. I ignored it, and I tossed my plastic cup in the trash can, continuing to wipe down the bar. Five minutes later, another loud clank came from the workshop. Now I was starting to get a bit nervous, I thought maybe the manager's down here working in the workshop. When the manager is here in the workshop, you can see bright lights from behind the machines, showing that the lights are turned on. But when I looked at the machine, the lights were off in the workshop. I heard rumors from my friends that our school was haunted, but I never thought anything of it. It was probably some silly story the students made up for fun to scare each other. But at that moment, I was beginning to think otherwise. I wasn't going to be silly and say it was a ghost. I wanted to say it was the manager, because maybe I just didn't notice he had come down here when I arrived. So, to be sure, I called out to him. Hello? Anyone in there? No response came back. The more I stared at the machines, the more I began to feel like I was being watched. I called out again. Hello? Whoever's doing that, I know you're back there. I can hear you. Yet no voice replied, but another loud clink answered. I ducked under the bar, trying to calm myself down, telling myself the sounds were nothing but the machines making noise. But as nervous as I was, I was certain someone was down here with me. But who? And why were they down here after school? I stayed sitting on the floor behind the bar for what seemed like forever. Finally, I mustered up my courage to look over the bar to see if anyone was there. I did so, and I slowly inched my way up to the top of the bar. No one was in the bowling alley. It was just me. I decided to quickly wrap up my job and go home. I did not feel very safe down in the bowling alley, so I did just that, and I left for home. In the following weeks afterward, I was always nervous about going down to the bowling alley. I didn't tell anyone else because I was afraid. Afraid they'd think I was making the whole thing up or that I was a big baby. I did, however, tell my little brothers about the encounter. They think it's a ghost who lurks around the school. Even after that, I still worked down in the bowling alley and eventually I forgot about the event. I got used to working down there. My second encounter happened not too long ago. It occurred around mid-January this year. My dad's side of the family was hosting a big birthday party at the bowling alley for all the January birthdays my dad's side had. Believe me, there are a lot of birthdays. They included my dad, two of his sisters, my cousin's daughter, and a few family members who sadly moved on. The party ended on a great note and everyone had a good time. 
I made sure to save some treats for my girlfriend who couldn't make it. My dad, mom, my brothers, and I were locking up the bowling alley and cleaning up. Before we left, my dad asked me to turn off the workshop lights. I went to the workshop and turned off the lights. Immediately, it got pitch black in the workshop. I suddenly began to feel a bad feeling in my stomach, a feeling of pure terror and danger all around me. I felt like someone was watching me. I could feel that there was something bad right behind me, and if I didn't get the heck out of the workshop, I would be doomed. Adrenaline pumped through my body, and I went into high gear. I ran as fast as I could out of the workshop and burst out of the curtain as I made a break for the exit. When I made it to the exit, I made the mistake of looking behind me. Why I didn't keep running was beyond me, though, but I felt like I had to see what I was being threatened by. What I saw, it almost made me scream like a terrified schoolgirl. Behind the curtain, I escaped from this thing. I could immediately tell this thing wasn't human, though it did look like it. It was partially behind the curtains, so I couldn't see it entirely, but I did get a good look at it. I wish I didn't look, though. It was around four or five feet tall. It had gray skin that had a reflective look to it, and its body structure resembled that of a person. I couldn't see its face, but I could make out what looked like horns on its head. I booked it out of the bowling alley, locked up, and we left. Those were my experiences. Now, these next two experiences are from my youngest brother. Let's call him Rocky. Three. This experience of his happened four years ago, when he and my mom were down in the bowling alley cleaning. Since I wasn't able to clean that day, Rocky was cleaning the bowling lane's approach when he heard a sound in the workshop. He thought that the machines were making noise like they tend to do so he brushed it off and continued cleaning the approach. 30 seconds later, Rocky heard the sound in the workshop again. This time, Rocky heard it twice. He called Mom and told her where the noises were coming from. Mom said it was probably the machines making noise, just as I had thought. Rocky agreed with what Mom had said, so he continued sweeping the approach. Later, Rocky put the dust mop away and got the dustpan and brush to clean up all the dirt he collected. Just then, Rocky heard the noise again. Being curious, Rocky went into the workshop and turned on the lights. When he did, he didn't see anything bizarre. So once more, he shrugged it off and went back to work, but kept the lights on in the workshop just in case. Later, Rocky was changing the score sheets on the metal scoring tables when he saw a shadowy figure move around from within the workshop from the gap between lanes two and three where the ball return was located. Rocky went back into the workshop to see what was going on. When he arrived at the black curtain, he started hearing footsteps coming towards him from behind the machines. Rocky went into the workshop, determined to know what was making the noise. When he entered, he caught a glimpse of a dark figure standing at the machine of lane six. The figure was as black as the curtain, about four feet tall, slightly shorter than Rocky. Its hands had long nails and the hand stuck out to the side as it stood perfectly still. Other than that, Rocky could not make out any other details. He then ran out of the workshop and told my mom what he saw. Mom thought he was joking around and didn't pay much mind to his claims. The two of them finished working quickly and went back home. Four. The second encounter Rocky had was with my second brother this past January. We'll call him Trevor. Rocky and Trevor came down to the bowling alley to clean. They had the lights of the workshop turned on while they worked because if anything happened in the workshop, they could catch it immediately. At the end of their cleaning job, Rocky and Trevor were turning off the lights in the bowling alley. When they turned off the lights in the workshop, Rocky and Trevor saw a white ball of light. 
which the guys on Ghost Adventures would refer to as anomalies. They floated up to the ceiling and then slowly descended back down. Then Rocky and Trevor saw the face of a male. The face looked distorted, as if my brothers were looking at this man's face on a badly rendered, low-quality YouTube video. Since the face was distorted, Rocky and Trevor couldn't make out much detail. The face looked at them and then launched up into the ceiling and vanished. Rocky and Trevor ran out of the bowling alley, locked up the place, and went home. Finally, here are three encounters my brother Trevor had. The first he had was when he was in PE class two years ago. Five. At the time, the school's gym floor was being sanded down, so PE took place in the basement in the meeting hall. Trevor was in PE in the hall with his class. They were playing a game similar to freeze tag, except when you get frozen, you go into a circle until someone who hasn't been frozen comes and unfreezes you and everyone else in the circle. Trevor had just gotten tagged and he went into the circle. Shortly after arriving in the circle, Trevor's best friend, Drew, got tagged, so he and Trevor sat there together facing a wooden door. When Trevor and Drew were unfrozen, they escaped the circle and made their escape past the wooden door. When they arrived at the door, they heard knocking and footsteps coming from the other side. At first, Trevor and Drew suspected it was the school's janitors doing some cleaning, since the place was really dirty and wasn't the first place the janitors ever cleaned in the school. Since the door had a bunch of small holes on it for ventilation, Drew and Trevor decided to take a look at what was making the racket behind the door. When they looked down through the holes, Drew and Trevor didn't see anything down there, but the lights were on. They suspected the janitors were a lot deeper in the basement than they originally thought, so Trevor and Drew continued on with their game like nothing ever happened. Eventually, the gym teacher said it was time to clean up and go back upstairs since the class would be over soon. There was a hula hoop left behind by the wooden door from another class, so Trevor and Drew decided to go get it. When they arrived at the door where the hula hoop was, Trevor bent down and grabbed it. Before taking off, he decided to get one last look through the holes of the door to see if the janitors were down there. When Trevor looked through the hole, he saw a dark figure standing at the bottom of the staircase. Trevor jumped back in surprise, telling Drew to take a look for himself. Drew did so, and he saw the same thing my brother Trevor saw. Creeped out, Drew picked up the hula hoop, and he and Trevor hightailed it out of the hall with the rest of the class. Six. The second encounter took place a week after the first. Trevor and Drew were having recess at the time, but they were in the boys' bathroom on the second floor of the school doing their business. Drew had just walked out of the bathroom while Trevor was still washing his hands. As he finished up, Trevor grabbed a paper towel from the paper towel dispenser, dried his hands, and tossed it into the trash bin. Above the trash bin was a mirror. So when Trevor happened to look into the mirror after disposing of his used paper towel, he saw the same black figure he and Drew saw a week prior. The figure stood in the corner of the bathroom near the radiator, with its head looking down. After five seconds staring at this figure, the figure lifted its head. Trevor was in shock as he stared into its eyes. They were the blackest black eyes he had ever seen. The eyes had tiny red pupils in the center. Aside from those eyes, Trevor couldn't make out anything else since the rest of the figure was just all black. Trevor turned around to see the figure, but when he did, there was nothing there. No traces of what Trevor had previously seen was there. Confused, Trevor looked back into the mirror. He saw the figure again, but now it was standing right behind him. He could see the color drain from his own face, though, as he stood frozen in place in front of the mirror. Now that the figure was this close to him, Trevor could make out more details. It had a mouth full of sharp, gleaming white teeth, and it was smiling at him. 
He said it was the creepiest and scariest visual he'd ever seen. He ran out of the bathroom and back to recess where Drew had been waiting for him. 7. The third and final encounter took place three months after the second encounter. Neither Drew nor Trevor had seen a trace of the creepy figures since. This encounter took place at Drew's house, where Trevor was spending the night. Around one in the morning, Drew and Trevor were playing Halo 4 and Xbox One in the living room. Drew had to go upstairs to use the bathroom, and Trevor was left alone downstairs. When Drew went up the stairs, he warned Trevor about the hunchback creature he'd seen around his house lately. This seemingly came out of nowhere for Trevor. So he was creeped out by this, but at the same time felt as if Drew was trying to mess with him. About a minute later, Trevor started hearing footsteps coming from the kitchen. He had a feeling that Drew might have been telling the truth about this creature, so he decided to go check it out to see what it really was. Coincidentally, there was a flashlight on the dining room table that was approximately five feet away. He grabbed it, turned it on, and entered the kitchen. Lo and behold, he saw what appeared to be the shadow of some sort of hunchbacked person. It looked very similar to Quasimodo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It went into the room where Drew kept his dog and a bearded dragon. He followed the shadow into the room, but he no longer saw it as if it had disappeared. All that was there was the dog sleeping and the bearded dragon that had its eyes glued in Trevor's direction. At that moment, Trevor knew that the bearded dragon was either looking at him or something behind him. He turned around, but luckily he saw nothing there. No more than a second later, Trevor heard a pan hit the floor in the kitchen. He looked into the kitchen and saw this shadow again looking straight at him. He slowly started to approach the shadow, but the shadow faded away and turned into another anomaly flying into the basement. At that moment, Trevor found Drew looking into the dining room, his mouth gaping open in shock. Trevor asked if he'd seen that, to which Drew replied, heck yeah, I did. With that, the two of them went back to the living room and continued to play games to keep their minds off of this situation. Trevor said every time he goes over to Drew's house now, he and Drew are always on high alert for that shadow. Those are all the encounters my brothers and I have experienced recently. From listening to my two brothers' experiences and my own, I know that the paranormal does exist and it changed my view of the world. There are things in this world we can't explain, and I can't find an explanation for what my brothers and I saw. One thing I can say is that I completely believe in the paranormal now. Be safe out there, everyone. You never know what supernatural danger awaits you until it finds you. Two Paranormal Experiences in Nevada From Philip S. This is a collection of weird experiences I had in Nevada. They still creep me out to this day, but talking about them more often helps me get through them. 1. My Sister's House It was spring break of 2014. I was 16 at the time and a junior in high school. I was visiting my sister and her family for the week. She lives in Tonopa with her husband and three kids. It's three hours north of Las Vegas. Tonopa is a very small town and basically in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by mountains. My sister's house was in a small suburb-like neighborhood, where each house is almost touching each other. The first couple of days went well and without incident, but one night, it was just me in the house. My sister and her husband were on a date at the bar, and the kids were with their biological father. I was still tired from jet lag, so I went to sleep. I texted my sister to see if I could have one of their pistols under the pillow just in case. Being alone way out here, it would make me feel a lot safer. She said it was fine, so I grabbed a Glock. Sure, we were surrounded by neighbors, but I felt more protected, and plus the neighbors weren't home. 
I put the gun under the pillow. They didn't have an extra room, so I slept on the couch. The way I slept is that I had my back facing the living room and my face against the cushion. There's still a little bit of light outside by then. I was exhausted, though, so I didn't care. My sister had a few reptiles, so she had their lamps on at night. So when it gets dark, there would still be some light in the living room. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a chill, and I started to smell something strong. It wasn't putrid like rotting meat, but more like cologne. I turned and saw something that made my eyes widen. There was a tall, humanoid, black figure, and it was leaning down a few feet away from me, just staring at me. It had no eyes, mouth, or nose, no facial features, not even hair. It looked like someone in a black morph suit. The lamps didn't reflect any light off of it either. I grabbed the pistol and pointed it in its direction, but by then it was already gone somehow. My heart was pounding like I had just survived the worst panic attack. It took me a while to get back to sleep. I didn't see it anymore that week, but I did see these white orbs and a few shadows out of the corner of my eye. From time to time, I still smelled that weird scent. On my last day, I heard Greg talking to someone in his room. I went over and asked who he was talking to, and he said, Mr. Black. I asked who Mr. Black was, but what he answered made me question myself. He said, Mr. Black's a tall, dark man. I don't know his name, so I gave him one. I think I know exactly who he's talking about. Thankfully, they moved to a new house a few years after. Screw that place and Mr. Black. The Mizba Hotel The Mizba Hotel is located in Tonopah, Nevada. If you're a fan of ghost adventures, then you'll know the place since it was featured in a few episodes. I was working as a dishwasher in the restaurant portion of the hotel in the summer of 2017. I was having troubles at home, so I temporarily moved to my sister's new house until things cooled down. On one of the nights, it got busy, and when it closed, there were a ton of dishes left. It was only me and the front desk attendant in the building. I went to the basement and received some towels, and on my way up, I heard a ping sound. I turned around in shock and didn't move. Ping, ping, ping. It sounded exactly like a pickaxe hitting rocks. It stopped as quickly as it came. So I got out of the basement and continued my job. Half an hour later, I went to the plate rack to drop off some plates when something caught my eye at the doorway leading to the restaurant. It was a woman in a red dress. I was paralyzed for the moment, dropping the plates I was carrying, which proceeded to shatter all over the floor. Shaking like I was in the south during the winter, I could see that she was looking into my eyes. She had a face like she wanted to say something, but couldn't, or didn't know how. After a few seconds, she disappeared like a mist. I cleaned up the mess and clocked out in a hurry. I was so terrified. I didn't want to stay a second longer. Turns out she's one of the residential ghosts they named the Lady in Red. I ended up losing that job because I didn't finish the dishes that night. I was bummed out as it was hard enough to find a job in a small town, but I understood. That hotel is really freaky, but an interesting place. Those are my experiences in Nevada and to this day I'm still in disbelief with these events. I don't think I'll ever forget them.